Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. Today we're going to explore Unit 5, which is going to discuss the plant growth nutrition needs. So all of the elements um, that we'll need for the growth of the proper growth of the plant. Uh, the first picture here is just an example of how the different elements get into a plant. Here is just a picture of a conifer uh, tree and it's just showing how it takes in the carbon dioxide, the CO2, and then that goes into the plant through the uh, leaves and down into the root system, and then that's where it converts it into, through photosynthesis from the sun coming in, and it makes the nitrogen, and then it gets into the roots and into the soil, into the bedrock, which creates the organic matter. It helps break up the soil. The, uh, different microorganisms that are in there help in that process. And then some of it, it's not going to use all of it. It's not a complete, um, you know, everything that goes in is going to be used, but some of it is going to be lost. And that's the part when we talk about if we artificially add um, some of these nutrients in, let's say nitrogen, um, the decomposition that we see right here is going to add some nitrogen over time. But when we get too much, if we add it ourselves, then it's going to run off, and that's the nutrient losses. That's what's going to go into the creeks and rivers and streams. Um, some of the things about plants is that and what, what is good is if the nutrients are there, they're going to self-nourish themselves. We don't have to worry about it. They have that system inside of them that they're able to do that. And basically, what that does is they synthesize carbohydrates, in other words, they change them, um, and they use the solar energy, the sun, carbon dioxide, the CO2 that's in the atmosphere, and then water, the moisture, and they use combinations of that in order to nourish themselves. In the process of that, um, for photosynthesis, there's three types of photosynthesis, and it's not so important that you memorize what these three types are, but just to understand in different areas, you're going to have different types of photosynthesis happening. Um, but basically, it converts the energy from the sun into a chemical energy. It's going to store it as a sugar. And just like for our human bodies, we need sugar for nutrition, so do plants. Um, the three types are basically the types of plants that generally use them, but it's also the location in which you're going to see them. In most areas, you're going to see C3. Um, and, and I just put some examples of like bean squash and tomatoes, um, but there could be other things that are going to use that too. But in tropical areas like the desert regions, um, you're going to uh, see a C4 and a CAM. Um, when it's hot and dry, um, you'll see more of the CAM. And when it's tropical, in other words, it's going to be hot, but it's also going to be wet, you're going to see the C4. And you can see the examples of the types of plants that grow there. So, for example, um, in Hawaii, you'll have a lot of succulents uh, and pineapple in the desert southwest. You're going to see um, Arizona, New Mexico. You're going to see a lot of the cactus and succulents. And that's why they're, they're good and they grow there because based on their, their climate and the way the sun is converting, uh, the sun is going to be converted through photosynthesis into the different types of energy. Um, here's an example of the different types of elements that are out there. I'm going to take the top ones first where it's H, C, and O, and that's for the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, and that's from the atmosphere. Those are what they call the God-created elements. Um, and that's everywhere, and that's why it's in that big oval on the top of it, because it's everywhere. Then you have your um, biotic group. And basically, that's because there are synthetic versions of it that when we put on fertilizer, we put on NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Um, but there's also, biotic means it's living. And that's also things that can be in and are indeed in the soil, or certain plants will put some of those things back into the soil as they grow, or rotting um, uh, trees and plants. Um, we'll also do that in, and to create that in the soil. And then there's a basic group, and that's um, that it's there. It might not always be there because if it's used up, it, it has a certain amount in the soil, but it's not going to necessarily regenerate it. And in that group, there's calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Sodium is salt. And then there's a mite 
minor nutrients or micronutrients is another way they call it. And sometimes you'll be driven nuts because they use different ways to refer to the same thing. But these are common occurring elements within the soil, but they're not used in uh, a very high amount. They need a little amount. And we'll go through each of those relatively quickly so that you can see um, you know, what, what those things are. And then there's some that are even less used and they call them incidental. They just aren't, they, they, I guess it, the best way to say it is it's not necessarily something that you need to have. Plants can do without them, but they could do better if you have them. And then there's a couple they call the accidental ones. Um, and, and those are ones that most of the time you're never gonna see and you'll never use them. Or plants will never use them. Um, carbon partitioning, and that's where um, it, it's the plant, basically it's the plant's ability to be able to distribute all these different elements into the places where they're going to be used in the plant. Um, and it's something you don't have to do, but it's something you have to pay attention to what elements are there, what nutrients are there, so that it, the plant can use them if indeed it wants to. Um, how you're going to get um, some of these things, um, the source of them, um, through the leaves is where a lot of it happens through transpiration. Um, there's stomatal openings in leaves that allow um, water and nutrients to enter into um, CO2, to enter into the plant and go down to xylem uh, and, and get to the different parts of the plant. For instance, the stem, um, it uses a phloem to get out to that. And then eventually, once it travels through the plant, it's going to go to the final resting place where the sugar is going to be generated or in, in the fruit. And that's why in a lot of plants, the fruit, that is how it's going to create uh, new things. We're also eating a lot of the fruit, um, whether it be corn or soybeans or it's an orange or an apple, those types of things. But that's where that carbon eventually gets to and that's where um, a lot of the nutrient or a lot of the things we live off of as humans. Um, soil pH, it's, it's very important that when we look at um, how plants grow, we have to look at what the soil pH is. And basically, it's just a measure of how acid or how neutral or how alkaline the soil is. Um, it's, it's important because plants like a certain range. Most plants like somewhere in the ballpark of between five and a half and seven uh, in the Midwest, but in, in a lot of the world they do. But there are plants that some like acidic soils, some like neutral soils to grow. And that's something you'll learn as you learn the different plants um, that, that you'll be planting. Um, micro, or macronutrients tend to be less available in soils that have a low pH. So if you have a, you know, like a zero, one, two, three uh, of your soil pH, that means you have an acid soil. And that just means that those macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, aren't going to be available as much. Even though they're there, they won't be used because the pH is too low. On the other hand, micronutrients tend to be less available if you have a high pH. And the micronutrients are, it was the sodium, um, the boron, um, molybdenum, um, and the ones like that. And we'll get into the, the detail on those. But it's just how they are. And if you have a high pH, it's not going to affect it as much for the growth because a lot of that stuff isn't directly needed in huge amounts anyway for that plant to be able to grow properly. It just might not be as good as it could be. Um, for soil pH, if you have one that's an acid soil, okay, it's acidic, and you want to make it less acidic, in other words, to go up to the middle, which is on a pH scale around seven is the middle, um, you can add lime to the soil. It will raise it, and, and there's tables you can go to when you need to do it. Based on your pH, it'll tell you how much lime you need to add. And this is a very, very common thing um, for farmers to do, to add lime at the end of the season after the crops are out. Um, in this range from six to six and a half, the nutrients are more readily available. So that's where you want to try to keep your pH in your soil if you're going to be growing things in there. Um, also, the microbes that are in the soil, the organisms that are in the soil, will increase and do better. The more acidic it is, the less you're going to have. Okay? 
the microbe's job is to convert that nitrogen and sulfur into forms that the plants can use. Um, lime will enhance the physical property of the soil and a lot of the different nutrients you add, um, amendments, excuse me, that you add to soil are going to um, make it so that the soil is more malleable or more workable, uh, especially in uh, areas that have a clay soil. Um, and, and that's a very, very, very good thing. And if they're more uh, permeable, then that means that they're going to promote water and air movement within the soil, which means that microbes are going to be able to move better and the roots are going to grow better within that soil as opposed to be not being able to get through the soil. And it's not going to um, keep water in one area. It's going to let it flow through it. Um, in order to find that out, the only way to know what your soil pH is, I guess you can tell if stuff doesn't grow right, but then you need a soil report. So you have to test it. And there's procedures you go to. There's, there's test labs that you can uh, send your soil to. And if you've never done it, it's a very good thing to do. You can get pH kits where you actually just take a little bit of the soil, um, mix it with water, and then you can put a test strip in and it'll show up the color. And based on the color, you'll know whether it's acid or neutral or uh, um, alkaline in terms of what your soil is. Um, in, in with the soil pH, um, you want to convert that nitrogen and sulfur into forms that plant can use. And, and, and I haven't mentioned in the prior slides when I talked about the soil or sulfur, and I should have, Sulfur is needed in the soil to drop your pH. So if your pH is too high, in other words, if it's too alkaline, you put sulfur in the soil uh, in order to um, lower the pH. Um, lime enhances the physical properties, like we mentioned on the prior slide, and it promotes the, the movement of the air and the water. And um, so we want to make sure we do that. And even if it's um, a problem with the conversion of the nitrogen, you need to know that with that soil test in order to be able to fix issues you might have. For plant nutrient cycles, um, I mentioned earlier a couple slides back that there's macro and micronutrients. Basically macro means large, so the qu or quantity of that nutrient that you need is larger than micronutrients would be. Micronutrients tend to be just in trace amounts. A lot of times people don't even look at the trace amounts, but you can really increase what your production is if you're trying to grow something by um, testing that soil to know what level of micronutrients are in there. You could actually have too high of micronutrients, um, but they do use them in small quantities, but each one has its role in terms of what it does for the plant. Um, the macronutrients, the three ones, are um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and PK. And those are the symbols from the periodic table of elements, the N, the P, and the K that stand for. Those you will see many people talk about. They aren't going to say nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium all the time. They're just going to say NPK because it's a lot easier. Um, here's a picture of... So, uh, an area that is actually growing very well, but it's a conservation effort where they're um, along a uh, waterway and they're trying to get rid of invasive weeds that they have here. Um, there's a knotweed, I believe, is what they're trying to get out. They have the plastic bags that they're taking out. It's a sandy soil um, along um, Lake Michigan, actually, that you can kind of see in the background there, and it's the swampy waters right next to it. Um, but they're trying to get it so that um, the, that weed is taking too much of the nutrients for the other uh, native plants and species that are there. So they're trying to get rid of that in a conservation effort to make it uh, better for the growth of the ones they want there. Um, and talking about nitrogen, that's what's needed in the largest quantity. Um, it's generally what goes first out of it. That's what nitrogen is what makes your plant green. So if the first thing is if you have a yellowing type plant, they call it chlorotic. Um, when it becomes deficient, and that be the case, you pretty much need nitrogen. And there's many ways that we'll talk about in other chapters and how you get that back in. This chapter, we're just trying to kind of explain um, what you'll use. About percentage total-wise, 1 to 2 percent of the total macronutrients that you use, up to about 5 percent, you also have to be careful you can put too much nitrogen on. And if you put too much nitrogen on or there's too much in the soil, it can actually burn the uh, plant and actually kill it in some cases, depending on the plant. 
phosphorus is part of the DNA chromosomes or the uh, RNA of the nucleus and ribosomes. Basically, what it's needed for is to allow the movement into and out of cells. Um, the metabolism, in other words, the changing of the CO2 into sugar won't happen if you don't have phosphorus. But what we're also seeing is that as the levels build up in a plant, the availability will actually decrease. <coughs> and, and actually what that means is in most fertilizers, the P is being removed, the phosphorus is being removed because we're getting too much in the soil and if there's too much there, it actually won't use it. And we really need it to promote good sugar metabolism. So what we're finding out is we just have to find a way to unbind or let loose of the phosphorus that's in the soil. And that's some of the stuff we'll talk about in future chapters. Um, if you have a lack of this, that there's going to be a rooting and fruiting, there aren't going to be as good of root system in your plant. And the fruiting, in other words, the size of the apples or the oranges or whatever it is you're growing, corn cobs, aren't going to be as large. The potassium, it's taken up by the roots once it's in there. It's also in the soil to begin with, but it helps in the, um, the movement, somatal movement, in other words, through the cells of the plant. And it does the regulatory stuff, so it helps um, stuff move around in the plant to the places it needs to. If you don't have enough potassium, ways you might know what it is. Of course, testing is always the best way. But if you have curled leaves or there's drying tips on your leaves or if you take the plant out and there's root rot, um, there might be um, a deficiency in potassium. The secondary uh, macronutrients, while they're still needed in larger quantities than the micronutrients, they aren't quite as much as in need as the uh, primary uh, macronutrients. And this is calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Um, they still need relatively high levels, but they're not as important to how a plant's going to grow. In other words, the, the fiber and structure of that plant. Calcium is absorbed by the plant roots. Um, it increases the soil biota. Uh, it has a, an important role in the development of the cell wall. Um, where it's used a lot is if you put lime in. When we talked about a lot of the farmers are putting lime in to um, change the pH in their soil. They want to raise it. Um, you can also put gypsum, and gypsum is what's in uh, drywall, in, used in houses, but it's also something that it reduces the amount of salts that are in a soil, but it also breaks apart the clay and makes it more uh, permeable to use. Um, and through the whole process, this calcium would actually, if you put gypsum or lime on there, either one, it's going to help with the plant strength as long as you don't get too much. Magnesium, um, the plant roots will take it up. It's one of the elements that's essential for photosynthesis to happen. And it's what starts that process of converting the CO2 into sugars, uh, into carbohydrates. Um, it's part of chlorophyll. And there's a deficiency. If there's a deficiency, you'll see that there's a yellowing between the veins of the older leaves, not on the newer things because they're just coming out and they probably have enough nutrition, but as they get older and larger, it doesn't get out to the outer parts of the leaves. So when the veins are there, you have the yellowing in between, it can't get out to them. Sulfur um, is used um, sparingly, it doesn't use a lot of it, but it helps in the formation of chlorophyll. It improves your root strength, so in other words, it helps the roots become more vigorous, uh, which if the roots are more vigorous, then your plant's going to be more vigorous. You're going to have a larger plant, a healthier plant. Um, it also helps to a limited extent um, with resistance to cold. Um, usually you never have to worry about adding sulfur, but you could, and there's usually a reason why there isn't sulfur in the soil. Um, and it will also make the soil more acidic. In other words, you would be using sulfur when it, your pH is on the higher side. It's above seven, so if you're like eight, nine, somewhere in there, you'd be adding sulfur to bring down that amount. Of course, acidic is on the lower end of the sale, scale and alkalines on the upper end of the scale. Um, you will see sulfur a lot in uh, compost and uh, animal manure.
Here's a list of the micronutrients. Um, I have this here so you can go through. I'm not going to read each one there, but there's seven micronutrients that are available in the soil that you can use, and it talks about what they're used for. Um, the micronutrients that we have, uh, they're the ones that were listed on there, and these are the uh, symbols from the periodic table of elements for what they are. So if you see them, you'll know what they are for the molecular makeup of, uh, of different uh, plants. Uh, here's some examples, and, and we're going to show you on the different micronutrients. I think the best way is you need iron, okay, but you can also have too much. And here's an example of they have a mining operation that they had, and when they get done, um, there's water that comes in through those mines. They fill up. I mean, generally a lot of mines that they have um, will fill up with water after they're used, and then because it was an iron ore, uh, mine, which iron is naturally occurring in different locations. Here's contamination because there's too much iron coming out. And then you see the, the example of the orange, a rusty color that you see. Okay? Um, if they did it right and they graded everything right after they were done, we wouldn't have this. And there's a lot of issues with that, and that's what they're trying to look at to reduce some pollution in some of the areas where this mi iron ore uh, mining happens. Um, what's iron used for? It's essential for the synthesis of chlorophyll, in other words, for it to change from the sun to the sugars. Uh, it helps uh, with enzymes, and enzymes are used to activate different processes um, within that conversion from uh, the photosynthesis process, and it does the electron transport. Um, and in the soil, it's naturally there either as iron sulfate or iron chelate are the two uh, ones, and that's what they mine. Um, next one we're going to talk about is zinc. It's also needed for formation of chlorophyll. It also activates enzymes. <coughs> it's involved with the metabolism, uh, basal metabolism, which is the lower level of metabolism within the plant. Uh, it assists with breaking down a protein, so in other words, when it's converting those uh, starches into sugars, it uh, helps with that process, and it's also what allows for hormone biosynthesis, in other words, for those fruits to form. Uh, molybendum, if I'm pronouncing that even correctly, the picture here basically shows um, on the left where you have it, and on the right or excuse me, I'm saying that with a deficiency, you see what the difference is and how it looks. And look how vibrant it is on the right and it isn't on the left. Um, the deficient ones show you that it's not as green. If you look at it, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but the, the plant certainly isn't as vigorous as how tall those and strong those are. And look how smaller, how much smaller those ones are with the deficiency of molybdenum. Um, and look at the difference in even the height, but the color is a, li it's a little darker green here than it is here, but some of that could be the light too. But that just um, shows you um, what a, a deficiency would look like. Um, in terms of things it does, it creates the nitrogen fixation. In other words, it takes that nitrogen and lets it be used. It promotes phosphorus uh, metabolism. That's the phosphorus that's in the soil. This isn't going to happen, if, of course, if it's not there. Um, but it's more of a, a controlling uh, element and not so much it needs it for plant growth. But it, it, it needs it in the sense that the different processes wouldn't happen as well without molybdenum being there. Um, Generally, there's going to be a deficiency if you have an acid soil, so that's the soil that's less than 7 on the pH scale, and it's naturally occurring in the soil. Chlorine, it's needed for cell hydration, in other words, to get water into the different cells. It also activates enzymes for photosynthesis, and it helps in the metabolism or that changing from the carbohydrates into sugar. And it's naturally occurring in the soil, too.
Um, all of these micronutrients can also be added if you need to. You can add them, and it's very, very small amounts that you'll add them if you need to. Most of the time, you never have to worry about it. Here's a picture of uh, a stream that's turquoise blue in color because it's there was a copper mine that they had, and they didn't properly close it down. And you can see when it's coming out, it's kind of a pretty color, but not so good in uh, putting all this uh, uh, water into the uh, environment. Um, copper is used for nitrogen metabolism, mi micro, if I could say that right, nitrogen metabolism. Uh, it's also used in the cell development, the basal metabolism. Um, it's very, very important um, when, if you have it for reproductive growth, it wouldn't happen as well if you didn't use it. And it also helps use the protein that's in uh, the sugars. Magnesium, or manganese, I always say, say that the wrong way. It's part of nit nitrogen metabolism also. Um, also involved in the basal or cell metabolism. Uh, it helps stabilize uh, the structure. And it's also found in the soil. Here's boron, and here's an example of uh, if there's a deficiency of it. And what's interesting is how they describe it. You can see there's this yellowing on the edges, which a little bit would kind of make you think possibly it was chlorotic because there's yellowing for that. And sometimes it's, that's what's difficult in trying to figure out what are we deficient in when we see something because there can be many things it could be, and it could be more than one thing. But something for a boron toxicity, in other words, there's too much of it, it's an inverted V, and you have to give it a little bit to see it, but do you see how it's wider at the base than it is at the tip of the leaf? So that's that inverted V if you go up, if you will. And it's not a perfect one, but it's basically, it, it, you know, it, it shows it. Um, for boron, it helps uh, the carbohydrates move around. It activates growth regulators, which in other words helps the plant grow, the cells to multiply and divide. <coughs> and it helps use the nutrients that are in the in the soil. It also aids in the production of sugar and carbs, um, which are the necessary in that photosynthesis process. Uh, it's also needed, in, or, in other words, to develop uh, seed and fruits um, for the continuation of that plant. Um, organic matter and borax are where um, boron comes from, and Deficiencies are usually attributed to alkaline soil. So in other words, if your pH is above 7, you know, going up approaching the 14 level. And then here we have the attributions for the different pictures we had.